We would start with the vote only calendar, but since we don't have a quorum, uh, we won't be able to do that. That's starting on page 101. So we will come back to that. We'll skip to page 107, Department of Mental Health, State Hospitals. This item deals with patient caseload staffing and related adjustments for a savings of $7 million. Mr. Cheney. Um, I, I, this is, ugh. LAO, why don't you describe who, this universe is so small, I'm wondering what the, you know, real caseload could be, what the cost, I mean, this is just like the most expensive people in the world, right? I mean, what are we talking about? It's a 15, well, no, that's just the reduction. I mean, what are we talking about here in total cost for these, like, it's two, two, what, it was about five hospitals now? Why don't you Good give afternoon, us a little committee members. On this Meredith one? Worden, Legislative Analyst Office. This is, uh, this, special um, is a technical adjustment to the state hospital caseload. Um, the total funding for the state hospitals well, is about $1.2 billion general fund to support generally forensic patients committed to the state hospitals. There are some um, civilly committed patients that are supported by county realignment funds known as Lantern and Petrus Short. Um, this adjustment reflects um, revised caseload estimates in the current year and budget year. In the current year, caseload has decreased significantly, which also has a budget year impact. In the budget year, the governor has proposed an adjustment to reflect a net increase um, of 113 judicially committed patients, as well as a decrease of 71 civilly committed patients. Um, and this re is resulting in about $7 million in general fund savings in the budget year. But that's just the natural decrease. I mean, that's just the mm -hmm. caseload adjustment. Mm -hmm. I guess the, my broader question is, you know, what are, where are we at with vacancies? These are 24-hour care, but a billion dollars for 6,000 people? I mean, in schools we get like, you know, um, know for a billion dollars I can... The department has had trouble um, filling vacancies in prior years. The vacancy rate has been declining in recent years. Um, the state hospitals are also um, activating Colinga, um, which is in that process of um, staffing up and admitting um, new patients. And so you'll see an increase in expenditures there. Additionally, the costs for the state hospital have also been increasing due to um, the CRIPA investigation um, for the Civil Rights for Institutionalized Persons Act, the state hospitals are under court monitor and have had to increase their staffing ratios to meet these federal requirements. I, I don't know. Is, is there some other um, public, and there, there's some, well, the recent, I don't know, what are we mandated, who are we mandated to put in here? There's Coleman issues and then there's the initiative that says everybody has to go there issues. Um, there SVPs, are several right. um, patient populations that are me that get ordered to a court hos or state hospital treatment. Those include individuals from the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation under the Coleman lawsuit um, to increase um, psychiatric care for inmates. Additionally, the um, enactment of Jessica's law in 2006, also yeah. or also known as Proposition 83, um, changed uh, legal requirements or legal. Um, implications for individuals um, deemed as sexually violent predators. It um, made the restrictions more stringent. Um, that has contributed. Did that lead to this 113 judicial Not entirely. Part the of it? the um, increase that you see here is primarily due to an increase in sexually violent predators as well as individuals deemed inc incompetent to stand trial. Mm. And based on our review, these caseload adjustments appear reasonable. Oh, they do? Okay. What's the vacancy issue? Do you know? Vacant positions, are there any we can take? I don't know, whatever. Uh, Madam Chair, members, John Doyle, Department of Finance. The vacancy rates have come down. Uh, the department is working to 
get in compliance with CRIPE, but they need to be in compliance by November of this year, and then they need to maintain that level until November of 2011. So vacancy rates are still high. There, there are some uh, classifications that still have significantly high vacancy rates, uh, primarily in the um, uh, clinical classifications. So this reduction assumes that you're going to fill them, or? Well, this reduction is uh, a combination of things. It's, it's primarily um, the current year budget eliminated the general fund subsidy for uh, county LPS beds. As a result, the department has seen the number of beds purchased by counties drop. So that's part of the reduction, but and that's good. But the department is um, it's making the the typical staffing adjustments that it would make for uh, caseload drops, but they still have to maintain certain levels to comply with CRIPA. Mm -hmm. Any other questions or comments for members? This just, one. If, if you find more, take it. I mean, that's all I'm <laughs> concerned about. I, this one this one is just so frustrating. I mean, I'd rather spend the billion dollars on the prisons than here, but I mean, it's, you got to do this, and I get it, and there's Coleman, and there's Kripa, and there's all sorts of legal stuff constraining us, not to mention Jessica's Law, which is added to the population, but I don't know if there's a better way to constrain this. I mean, we don't have the money to pay for local mental health services. But we're spending a billion. This is more than the six. This six thousand people is more than the cost of the entire CalWORKs program, which serves 450,000 people. So that's kind of so. A I measure. think the message is: if we can find more, take it. Let's gratefully take this reduction. At least that's my recommendation. And I think the direction from the committee is really clear, <laughs> or at least from the vice chair. And I would I would agree with the vice chair. If we can find more savings in this area, we should take it. Venture. It's an extremely expensive population. Yes, Mr. Leno. In many ways, it is what it is, and it'd be great to take the seven million and see if there isn't more. But could you clarify for us? My understanding is uh, Jessica's law doesn't so much increase the population; is it increases the costs, it, not it, to increase the population. It also increases, it expanded the population that has to be screened to screened, see if, but it doesn't um, if they qualify. The commitments. To the extent that more people are screened as being SVPs, then it increases the number of SVPs that we're facing. Based, it, it broadens the pipeline of the number of people who have to be screened. But in fact, I don't think it has resulted in that many. It, it has not resulted in the number of additional SVPs that was initially assumed. But it's enormously expensive. What, this, kind, of, what kind of numbers are we talking about? The, the, for the uh, screening and referral process, we're talking about $30 million. $30 million. I understand it's done very well for a group of psychiatrists, but it's not the, much for the state or the safety of our communities. Um, Editorial opinion. <laughs> <laughs> no response necessary. All right, members, is there a motion then to approve, to adopt this, but to direct staff to search for more savings? To, to adopt and, and all right, that's been moved. 5-0 on the Senate side, 4-0 on the Assembly side with Mr. Nielsen absent and he can add on later. Then members, let's go back to the vote only calendar which we would have started with. Um, it's between pages 101 and 105. Is there any item that any member needs to take off the calendar for discussion or, or separate vote? Uh, separate vote on page 104. We'll be voting now. Okay. Page 104. Mm -hmm. Ditto. Separate vote. Senate Republicans are no on 104. Same. Same on the assembly side. So then 101, 102, 103, and 105. Is that right? Yeah. Those are I votes. 5 0, 4 0 on our side with Mr. Nielsen being absent. Then on 104, it is um, 3 2 on both sides. Excuse me, Mr. Nielsen was absent on. All right, he's a. Now he's here. He's here. All right, is that clear? So we can go back. Mr. Nielsen, we need you to add on to items 104. 1 through 107. We've taken votes on those and you can add on later. Um, 
see here. We're back on one, page 108 now. Coleman versus Schwarzenegger bed capacity options may revise scores 25 million uh, additional costs. So um, could the LAO start with a comment on this item for us, please? Mm -hmm. The governor's May revision is requesting an increase of 25.3 million in general fund and 250 positions to support several proposals to increase the mental health bed capacity at Salinas Valley Psychiatric Program and the Vacaville Psychiatric Program in response to the Coleman lawsuit. An implementation of these proposals is expected to increase the DMH bed capacity at these programs by 162 beds. These proposals are part of a larger plan developed by DMH and CD CR to um, meet the court order to develop concrete proposals that immediately address the short and long-term uh, mental health bed needs of the Coleman class. Um, and the defendants have submitted this plan to the court, and the court is expected to hear a hearing, have a hearing on this plan in mid-June. We initially raised issues with this proposal due to lack of detail. Um, these, it appeared to be an extremely aggressive timeline and a, a significant request. Um, since then, based on our discussions with DMH and additional information provided by DMH that illustrated the staffing phase in, the request seems reasonable at this time, provided that budget language is adopted to um, require that these funds um, be only expended for this purpose. We also note that the administration has proposed budget language um, to require reporting to the JLBC up before expenditure of these funds. But the court's not holding a hearing on this until June? Soon, in June. Do we have any reason to believe the court's going to approve it? Or, I mean, do we have a tentative decision or any indication? My understanding is that this may not be sufficient enough to meet the court's needs. Yeah, that's what I'm concerned about. This seems really premature to me. Um, Mr. Nielsen and then uh, Mr. King. I'm aware that there's another possible settlement uh, on four of these major uh, class action suits that is in process. That there may be a memorandum of understanding. Are you aware of that? I am unaware of that. All right. So, so this, this is all based on prior information that you've had for some period of time, correct? Okay. Well, that, I, I, the, the deal is not done on it as far as I'm concerned, but I have been... I've talked to Secretary Kate and uh, the receiver, Kel Mr. Kelso, about this, and it, it may be something that would be very helpful. So it may be premature on this one. I, I think generally the history with the Coleman Court has been that whenever they don't necessarily approve our plan, as the LAO alluded, they generally ask for, order us to go with a higher level of expenditure and a quicker implementation timeline. So the potential of the court disapproving is likely to go in the other direction and to look at getting us additional resources. An example is last year the court order in the small management yards, we worked on a particular implementation timeline. The court came back with an order that was more aggressive in terms of implementation and that um, required us to come up with a higher level of expenditure than what we were initially proposing to the court. And, um, and a lot of the discussions in the context of the MOU and the settlement have been focused on the receiver side of the occasion, the, the, the extent to which the Coleman court might join that. I, I think is remains in discussion about what what it would require in order to satisfy the concerns of the court in the Coleman case. Your microphone, Mr. Nielsen. This this case has been going on since the early 1990s, and uh, I find no fault with the court in being impatient about <laughs> lack of response over the decades. Uh, Mr. Nielsen, just uh, another point of clarification: sir. the court also at a March 24th hearing indicated that. They wanted to see resources put in the current budget sure. project for the important, for the, the projects that they felt were critical. Okay. Understood. Okay. Thank Ms. you. Mr. Cheney. Well, I guess, I mean, this is the ongoing. I, I think Mr. Nielsen's right, though. If, if, if we're about to get a settlement on Kelso, whatever that court case is called, I mean, Plata. somehow, what is it called? Plata. <laughs> Plata, right. Okay. Um, I, I don't know how to think about merging its cost savings. I mean, our argument for some time on this has been, to the extent we're building health beds, we ought to build mental health and, I mean, build it all in together. If you're going to redesign it under one proposal, it doesn't make any sense to kind of have this whole separate redesign proposal in another arena. We, we've got to figure out some way that these things get coordinated because in this particular component, although it's under the DMH item, it's really a correction steal. It's really beds that are going to be built at Vacaville and what, Solano or something? 
I mean, and, and so these are beds that are going to be built in dilapidated prisons that we're not fixing, that already have hospitals, that we're trying to release people from, that, I mean, the, the whole thing is kind of complex in that way. And I don't know whether this, I mean, I appreciate the LEO now saying we had thought it was more of a question whether, you know, we need all these people at what timeline and how you use them. But I mean, Vacaville has a psychiatric program, oh, Salinas, sorry. Um, you're, you're talking about converting existing space, but there's also other programs converting existing space in the same facilities, and I don't have any sense that they're coordinated very well. It's been our, and, and I don't know whether we could use the $900 that have already been appropriate. Is this lease revenue? I mean, could we use lease revenue if we're doing spaces, or, or this is all operating? But you're converting. Senator, the um, uh, CDCR is going to be responsible for the any of the retrofits in these proposals. <laughs> And the funding is already in their minor capital outlay budget, based on information we received from CDC. Well, I don't know, Mr. I mean, I'm willing to, you know, maybe with they'll they'll hear this next week. I don't know that this plan works or doesn't work. I hate spending the money, mm -hmm. and and if we were able to settle the other one, I don't know why we can't kind of work on some of this one as well at least push this over into the corrections discussion rather than trying to solve it here i don't know if anybody else as assemblyman nielsen mentioned um you know we're continuing to work 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 with the court but judge carlton in the coleman case it's been a case that's gone um on for some time has been um generally not pleased with the state's progress and has continued to issue different orders that provide more specific timelines and require us to, to um, make some program enhancements. We're continuing to work with the court to address the court's concerns in the most cost-effective manner possible, but um, generally, whenever we go back with a plan, if the plan is not approved as submitted, it com they, they want us to go quicker, not well, slower. But, but if we're going to show them proposals that relate to release and changing sentencing and doing parole courts and doing some of those kinds of things. We're going to have lower population and we're going to reorient some folks to the community where they get community mental health services. Court might want to take that into account based on how many additional beds we might need. So I don't know how to kind of do this without. Well, that's that's the problem. We don't know what the judge is going to, going to approve to and require. Um, Mr. Leno. Uh, for the LEO, you, you alluded to this uh, just briefly, but with regard to the feasibility of all of this being implemented within 12 months, can Based you? Based on our conversation with DMH, they indicated that this would probably be implemented within less than 12 months and some of these proposals um, within six to eight months um, as required by terming it short term. So, and you think this is... I think, feasible and likely. I th based on our conversations with DMH, I think this is feasible based on prior implementation of similar proposals. Put it in the corrections package. I don't think we want to do this until we get to corrections and figure out what we're doing over there. Any objection to that, members? That just I would means think it'll that be that held that'd open. be a better idea stage. because these all are linked. They all fit together. You do them piecemeal, you're going to be in trouble. And in fact, this proposed agreement or settlement uh, it combines around four of them that would be a very helpful thing for the future. Okay, then that will be the committee's direction. Moving on to page 109, early and periodic screening, diagnosis, and treatment program for 2009-10 for an increased cost of $65.3 million. Um, Department of Finance, did you want to uh, start off on this one? Uh, Madam Chair, the um, adjustment that's being proposed, the largest reduction to the EPSDT program of 53.4 million is a combination of two components. The um, EPSDT estimate includes MHSA-driven costs, the, the thinking being that as the MHSA program expands, um, people become aware of other related mental health programs such as EPSDT. When we built the governor's budget, we included a general fund in the amount of $25.4 million for that impact. Um, when we got to May revision, uh, DMH has been working with um, the Petrus Institute at University of California to improve their estimating process. 
uh, consistent with the recommendations by OSE in their recent audit of the uh, program estimating process. Uh, at May revision, it was determined that the impacts of these MHSA-driven costs are already in the base. So this proposal would take out, the, it's in the, the claims that are submitted in the, so they're proposing to back out um, the 25.4 million in general fund. The second component is $28 million for new program costs that, these are um, MHSA driven programs that were developed in 2007, 8, and 8, 9. And we're proposing, yes, that we're proposing to take out 28 million related with those. The counties can uh, fund these with MHSA allocations. They've got funds for these programs in their three year plans, and the reimbursement portion will be left in the budget so that counties can draw down the reimbursement. Okay, so just in summary, there's increases and there's decreases. Yes. <laughs> and they're, they total to the 65.25, yes. okay. But and they're fed some of these programs are federally mandated. Well, and federally backfill, but the main thing is we're meeting the Prop 63 MOE. We are. Yes. Whatever it is that you're doing, we're getting basically down to that MOE, but we're meeting the MOE, and then they can do whatever they need to in the counties. Almost to the MOE, you have other components in your agenda that would get you right to the MOE. Okay. There, there's about 12, we're about 12.8 million above yeah, the MOE. Yeah, but there's other places where that gets used. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Move to adopt. Okay, members, we have a motion to adopt this item. Ms. Walters? We're going to um, lay off of item two. Right. If, 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 you, if you want, if you're going to do them separately, we'll vote no. If you want to do it all together, then we'll just lay off on the second one and support the rest of them. So you're trying not to vote on the thing the voters said not to do? I don't get it. I mean, how do we, we can't undo that, though. Oh, all right, but whatever. So then the motion would uh, be to adopt one, three, four, five, and six. Without objection, then the vote on that motion will be 5050. And then the next motion would be to adopt item number two on page 109. And on the Senate side, that would be three ayes, two not voting. And on the Assembly side, two no's, excuse me, on the Senate. In the Assembly side, it's 5-0 in favor. All right. And we can move on to page 110. Prior year cost okay. settlement claims for EPS TD, DT for uh, additional costs of 15.8 million. And Madam Chair? Yes, go ahead. You could do 12.8 of this 15.8 uh, and remain within the um, MOE. This would be essentially a deferral for a cost settlement for some prior year claims. All right, so then the motion, Madam Chair, if I might try that. The motion is to defer payment of the claims to 1011 um, and then um, pay for this using these 06 funds, the 12.8 of those 06 funds? Is that how that works? Yes. Using funds from 06. It, it, it's, it's prior it, year claim. I mean, it, would be, it would be a delay in claims. payment of prior year claim. It would essentially change your carry in balance into 89 and provide general fund benefit. That way, you would just pay these claims in a future year. And you can do 12.8 worth of it and remain within the MOE. Okay. Whatever she said, yeah, I move That's that. That's the motion. Mr. Dutton, did you have a question? Page 110. I'm just lost. What are We're we on doing page now? 110. Yeah, I know. It's 15, whatever, and you're saying 12? Or what, what are we? 12 of it they can take. From. We're deferring $12 million in payments and funding $3.8 million. No. So it's really just a deferral of money that we owe to the counties. A portion of the money that we owe to the county. We're deferring twelve point eight million dollars instead of the fifteen. We're deferring twelve point eight of it. We got to pay three of it because that keeps the Prop sixty three MOE intact. It's a savings. 
It's a savings. So you're saying it, approve three instead of 15? Is that yeah, what you're basically, basically saying? that's basically what amounts to. Correct. But you have to defer the balance. And then balance defer the balance. Yes. Okay. Have we assessed the impact on the counties of this deferral, though? It, it generally would be a, a, a delay in when counties will get repaid. These are for um, prior year claims. There were a series of prior year claims in, in this program associated with a change between accrual and cash. Um, and this would basically be elongating the payment for repayment of those prior but old year claims. It helps us to the tune of $12 mil million, but it exacerbates the county's plight. It, It'll, it'll delay county repayment of these claims. So these are for dollars that they paid in six, seven, I believe. Yeah, right? um, I'm sorry, uh, just a minor point of clarification. The, um, uh, as Ms. Montesanto said, the, um, there are prior year claims that are being repaid through the Budget Act. These uh, particular claims are for 2006, seven cost settlements so that when the year ends, they settle up the costs and they pay back what's owed if, if counties have been underpaid. Okay. I appreciate the clarification, but actually we're hurting the counties a little bit here. Well, Mr. Nielsen, this program has had more problems than anybody wants to admit here or discuss. But I mean, this thing has been a nightmare of pre-back claims for about three or four or five years. And we're catching up slowly but surely and cleaning up, I hope, somewhere along the line. There have been audits. There have been, I don't know if you all want to explain that. That, that So we're, that's why we're still dealing with those six claims. And anyway, it's ugly. Just take the money and run. Sounds that's like we're, we're ready to vote then. Without objection, on the Senate side, 5-0 to approve. On the Assembly side, 5-0 to approve. And we can move on to page 111. Adjust Healthy Families Program for CHIRPA for a savings of 704000 um, are we replacing general funding with federal money in this item? So there shouldn't be any controversy to that. Okay. Is there a motion to approve? All right. Uh, without objection then, 5-0 on the Senate side and 5-0 on the Assembly side to adopt. Page 112, proposal to eliminate Healthy Families Program Services. Uh, this issue will conform to other issues. Uh, depending on what we do with healthy families. So it seems like we can get, move on to the next item. Page 113, <laughs> proposal to eliminate the Caregiver Resource Centers Program for a savings of $10.5 million. Um, LAO, would you like to comment on this, please? Um, the administration is proposing to completely eliminate the general fund support for caregiver resource centers. These centers um, provide a number of services to individuals who are providing um, care to family members in their home who have cognitive impairments such as Alzheimer's, uh, traumatic brain injury, and stroke. Um, some of the services uh, these resource centers provide include respite services, education, coordination services. Um, we have these uh, centers provide services to about 15,000 uh, families and uh, based on conversations we've had with them, um, it appears that most of their funding is state general fund and they use these funds to leverage other federal funds um, through a national family caregiver support program that is administered through the Department of Aging. Um, and our understanding is that if these funds are eliminated, these 11 centers will shut down. Yeah, we may want to look at alternatives. Mr. Leno, then Mr. DeLeon, then Mr. Bloomingfield. Well, you answered my first question, which was the Bloomfield question. What percentage of these 11 centers' budgets are dependent upon general funds? It, it ranges. It's the majority of their budgets. Um, some of the centers are about 75. Others, Los Angeles, is about 90% uh, general And it is fund. seed money. I'm sorry? It's seed money in that they're able to get a leverage out of it. Um, this, these funds contribute to leveraging federal right. funds um, that make up the rest of their budget. So if we were to conceivably cut by 25 percent or so and leave the balance so that they're not left destitute, it's possible they could make up that difference of three or so million uh, by using uh, a sliding scale for, for uh, users? Um, my understanding is that some do um, charge some co-payments to users. I'm not sure to what extent, um, to the extent that these resources are cut, the centers would have to adjust their services to provide less. 
I don't see any numbers in my notes beyond the 11 centers. Do we know how many tens of thousands of people we're talking about? We're talking about a, about a 15,000 15, families. 15,000 families. Thank you. Mr. De Leon. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, these, uh, these folks who we're talking about, the cognitive uh, impaired individuals, are these folks in short uh, uh, folks who have brain injuries? Some of them have traumatic brain injuries. Some of them have suffered stroke. And these uh, resource centers support the caregivers who are keeping them at home and caring for them. And according um, to them, these services help delay, if not prevent, um, out-of-home placements. These are pretty severe cases, I would assume. To a certain extent, yes. Okay. And you may have answered this question uh, earlier. But to the degree of this cut, the proposed $10 million, $10.5 million, would we jeopardize their ability or their status to leverage uh, federal funds? They would no funding? longer be able to leverage any federal funds. If we take the $10.5 million or if we take any sort of cut? Um, if you take the 10.5, I, I will have to get back to you as to how much how much um, a, a particular cut would result in. I guess what we're trying to figure out is if, in fact, they do take a cut to how far can we go without putting them in that zone, if you will, or in that uh, at that level where they jeopardize their federal funding. Is I guess that's the question I'm trying to find out right there. I, I don't have the answer for you, but I Could can you, get back to please. you. Please. Okay, thank well, you very much. Do you want to wait for that, or we just try something, and if you can try and find out if it meets the challenge? Do it the other way well, around. there's a number of other I people was gonna waiting to speak oh, here. Sorry. <laughs> Mr. Blumenfield, Mr. Nilo, Mr. Lowenthal, and then we'll go back to Ms. Cheney. A couple of questions. The, has there been a, you know, given all the, the more veterans who are coming home with the IED injuries and the brain injuries, does that cause an increase in the number of cases, or are they primarily on the veterans? I'm role? not sure. I do know that they probably serve some veterans. Um, I, I'm not sure to how much that might be increasing their caseload. I mean, has the caseload been increasing substantially in the last year or two? It has. Um, prior year estimates have ranged around 13,000 in terms of services provided to families, and the most recent estimate I have is about yeah. 15,000. Because I would, I would caution, I, I would imagine that, that that's part of this. I mean, I think this is one of those programs, you know, we talk about, and a lot of these very critical programs, we talk about, well, we need to give things a haircut and not a, not a scalping. And the difference between a haircut and a scalping is sometimes just a matter of an inch. But um, <laughs> this is one of those cases I think we need to be make sure we don't go that deep. Mr. Nilo? Um, <clears throat> I have a question, but uh, a clarification with regard to <clears throat> uh, Mr. De Leon's uh, question when he said these folks, just to clarify, th these centers don't treat patients, they're resource centers for the caregivers. Yes. And I, not to d diminish uh, the services that they provide, but these are not direct patient services. This is support services to, uh, to caregivers. Um, could not counties uh, utilize Proposition 63 funds for this because in that case, it would not be a supplantation for them, and therefore, I would imagine, eligible. I'm, I'm, I don't think that these um, centers would be eligible for Prop 63 funds because these people have been diagnosed with cognitive impairments. Uh, Prop 63 funds support individuals who've been diagnosed with uh, serious mental illness. Um, such as schizophrenia in comparison to the individual who's had a stroke. Uh, Mr. Nilo, uh, just a point of clarification, the, um, the caregiver resource centers are, you know, were, have been counted towards the Prop 63 guarantee, so. I'm sorry, would you repeat that? They, they, had, been, they had been counted towards the Prop 63, the maintenance of effort. I'm, I'm not sure that I understand what you mean by that. I, you, you, you're, you're implying that uh, they, they somehow would qualify when you state a maintenance of effort, and yet LAO said it doesn't qualify. So am I getting conflicting information here? Um, Maybe I'm misunderstanding. No I, no, I believe. I'm sorry. I just wanted my point was to uh, I believe that the LAO may be right because we were using these funds and if we went back to the counties and said you have to use MHSA funds, it, it may be a supplantation issue. 
I, I'm not no, sure. No, I mean on a voluntary basis. I don't mean oh. uh, oh. I don't mean mandated by the state. I mean, if we reduce this funding, counties could choose to make up the difference if they had the resources, and if it if Prop 63 qualified, they could potentially have the resources. Uh, their own funding, their own budget challenges, challenges notwithstanding. <clears throat> I understand what LAO said. You, your answer would imply that uh, it's not even eligible uh, because they're not uh, the sort of mental health, uh, me mental illness type of conditions. Uh, I don't know if uh, this sort of service could be shoehorned into the um, uh, definitions and, and requirements of Prop 63. And I, I'm not suggesting that the state would would mandate it one way or the other. But if we implemented the cuts, and uh, uh, the, lo the, the the local entity, the county, uh, wanted to maintain the effort and had the funding source to do it, uh, like Prop 63, then that obviously um, minimizes the potential impact at the county's discretion. We we can consult with the department and get back to you on whether it would be an eligible um, expenditure from our perspective of Prop 63 funds, if that's mm -hmm. okay. Mr. Lowenthal and then Mr. Cheney. The caregiver resources center provides support and resources, obviously, to caregivers. I'm just wondering about the interrelationships. Do we know if many of these caregivers are also providing services in IHHS? My understanding is that these individuals are not eligible for IHSS services. So they cannot be providing, they're the caregivers, they cannot be the provider of IHHS? Uh, they're not providing service because I believe 60 percent of the IHHS providers are family members. I can get back to you on that. That's correct. Roughly 57 to 60 percent of IHSS providers are relatives. And so would they be also attending and getting support from the Caregivers Resources Center or no? I'm just wondering if this, these are all interrelated in any way. Maybe not. I'm not sure that there, there may be some overlap, but um, but but I'm not sure. Mr. Cheney, let me try something. I, I you know it's I mean I think from the testimony we're hearing and from what other folks are telling us that this one is a little different. It is overlapping in that it it is one another program that helps delay <clears throat> or hopefully prevent people from being admitted to nursing homes and such. I don't know that these have that sort of income base whole deal because these are nonprofits, right? So in it's, many it's, ways, they may not be the IHSS recipients. They are more the folks that came and testified here the other day are folks who are without IHSS compensation caring for their family members, mm -hmm. and these are supportive services for those folks. So it seems to me that we want to give them whatever help we can to A, keep them out of the IHSS and SSI and the other programs, and not to mention the nursing homes. So I would suggest, I mean, this is the total general fund provided to these folks, so they're obviously leveraging a lot of money somewhere from federal and, and community donations and such. But um, we were going to suggest a reduction, uh, I guess the, a, a reduction of three and a half million instead of ten and a half million would leave seven million in the program to divide up however best they can if somebody closes and others use it. I don't know how to think about that, but it would leave them something to work with. And then we could do that unless somebody comes back and tells us something different. I, I tend to agree with the opinion that this is not going to qualify for Prop 63. So the, redu um, the reduction is how so the redu much? Really well, the actual reduction to the program would be three and a half million. So, so you would leave seven million in the program. Okay. Yeah. So instead of reducing it by 10.5 million, you'd be reducing, reducing it by, by three, three, and point, yeah. three and a half. Is that a motion? That's a motion. Uh, I don't know if it goes anywhere. But. Madam, Madam Chair, if I may. Yeah. If, if you are going to make a different decision here, then you could revisit the, the item on page 110, and you could go to the full amount of 15.8, because both of these okay. count towards the MOE. Works so, for me. so you could get another three million in the other one. So we can have savings in, in both places. Okay. Yeah. Well, well, you, you end up with a lesser a level of general different. fund savings relative to the May revision, but you can get additional from that other item. Okay. Okay. So the motion is to reduce this item by three and a half million, rather than the May revises ten and a half, leaving seven million in the program, and simultaneously reopen and revisit page 110 
defer. and defer the whole 5.7. 110. Page 110. We're, we're yeah, 15.7, sorry. No so what we end up with, members, is essentially having done a minus of 15.7 from the governor's budget and so offset by a plus seven. It's yep. right. At eight million, we end up. Okay, somebody's going to have to clarify what we're doing here. Okay, right. let, the, let, the, let Anna the, yeah, explain it to you. Finance. The Prop 63 maintenance of effort looks at your overall spend, aggregate spending in a variety of different items, right? So um, the May revision proposal would have left you $12.8 million above that maintenance of effort. The um, item that you voted on previously basically is a deferral for when we pay certain costs to counties. In that action, you uh, gain $12.8 million relative to the May revision. If you don't make the full level of reduction that we're looking at here in the caregiver resource centers, then you can defer the full $15.8 million in the prior item, which ends, you, which ends up with a net effect to the May revision of around $6 million. So basically, you're, you're, doing, you're doing a deferral in the other one that gains about 15.8 relative to the May revision, um, and then here you do a lesser reduction, and you end up still being above the Prop 63 maintenance of effort by a couple of million. That's one time. The, the, the deferral, deferral is one time, and it's basically the counties that are picking up the tab on it. Is the deferral what? is one time. You're deferring when you're paying the obligation. Um, this reduction we were proposing as ongoing. It depends on what your action is, whether it would be ongoing or one time. So there's no really ongoing savings then? The reduction to this program would be ongoing savings um, unless you revisit it in a future year. So there would be a lesser level of ongoing savings relative to the May revision. There would be a greater level of savings relative to the May revision in 910. We get more savings this year and less in the future. You concur with that? Yes. All right, so that's the motion. Assembly side, uh, six you okay with that? I, I, I just want to clarify something. We, Mr. Nilo. What Ms. Matsantos just talked about were two unrelated issues. We're, we yeah. may be linking them rhetorically, but they certainly aren't from an action standpoint. So uh, the, this is still a reduction of, uh, of a spending reduction, and we still don't have uh, an answer as to whether Prop 63 funds could be used uh, uh, for it. I, I would not support um, the motion. Okay, so on the assembly side, it's 3-2, and on the Senate side, 3-2. All right. That's fine. Uh, uh, do we have to go back and do the other one? or have we No, a we seat? did it all as one motion. Page 114, restricts state, state funding to federally required services for savings of $113.4 million. Uh, Department of Finance, would you like to start off on this? Uh, the proposal here is to... Uh, reduce non-federally required services in the mental health managed care program. The services that are federally required are inpatient hospitalization and medications. This proposal would remove outpatient care. Um, it would give the counties, with, the counties would not be required to provide these services, but if they determined that they wanted to, they could using uh, county general fund or realignment funds. Counties. Mr. Cheney? Move adoption. We have a motion to adopt this item, members. Mr. Nielsen, you're okay. All right. So on the assembly side, it's 5 0 to adopt. On the Senate side, it's 5 0 to adopt. Page 115, defer AB 3632 mandate to counties for savings of 52 billion. Uh, Department of Finance, again, would you like to go first? And then I would like some comment on, from the LAO's office on this one. Our proposal here, Madam Chair, is to uh, reduce the AB 3632 mandate payment uh, by approximately half. The Early Budget Act contains $104 million for this program. We're proposing to reduce it by $52 million. Uh, the LAO has pointed out, and rightly so, that the mandate is underfunded. Um, this, uh, this program has 
typically been underfunded. We've been trying to uh, make up uh, prior claims. We built money into the budget. We uh, beginning in 2005-06, uh, the Budget Act contained um, 60 million for prior year uh, claims. Or, I'm sorry, 120 million for prior year claims. The next year, we built in 66 million for prior year claims. So we've trying we've been trying to catch up. Our proposal here is to defer uh, approximately half the estimated amount. So the Department so, of Finance is saying it's a deferral. The LAO may somewhat disagree with that analysis. But but I, I well, I have a question for the Department of Finance, but go ahead. Um, this proposed reduction underfunds the mandate according to the State Controller's Office Deficiency Report. The uh, required payment in the budget year is about $160 million, and the the governor's proposal only provides $52 million to pay these prior year claims, which results in a shortfall of about $108 million. Without a suspension or repeal of this mandate, the state is required to pay this allocation under onto the Constitution. But it's a federal mandate, right? There's there's a, it's a there's an underlying federal special education mandate that state law in the 80s shifted to county mental health to provide certain services. So there's some special ed required federal mandates, and then there's a state law overlay that shifts some of that responsibility from schools to mental health. Basically, our, the effect of our proposal is to delay the implementation of the ag agreement relative to 3632 that was included in the Budget Act in 56, and just in effect delay delays the period of which we, we start funding at the, at the at our best estimate for the cost, which, um, as you've heard, in the, at the time of the Budget Act, we were looking at $100 million. Now data from the um, SEO suggests that it's 160. Okay, so I think I know the answer to this, but my question was really going to be why defer 50%, not 100%, or some figure in between. But if we deferred 100%, it sounds like we'd, we'd have to suspend the mandate. Our, our, our judgment is that providing a, a lesser level of funding and basically delaying the implementation makes sense to be able to continue moving forward without suspending the mandate. And we're basically just deferring implementation and kind of being consistent with what we've done in budget acts in the past. Elio. Marianne O'Malley from the Ledge Analyst Office. The Constitution sets forth a very clear minimum funding level for this mandate. And the May revision amount is $108 million below. If the committee adopts the May revision amount, there is a very significant chance that counties are going to bring the state into court and have their, and, and ask to be freed from the requirement for carrying out the mandate. As a point of reference, it's important to know that counties are owed this, by the state almost a half billion dollars for this program. If we underfund it by another $108 million and bring it below the minimum funding level specified in the Constitution, we, have a, we stand a very high chance of counties bringing us into court and having them freed from the obligation of carrying out this program in the budget year. Mr. Cheney. Well, wait a minute. I don't know how this got in the Constitution. I do remember the part where San Diego sued and won a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. So I'm trying to figure out where in between the Constitution and the San Diego lawsuit we, we get to. And, and whether some of the federal special ed money might be utilized for this purpose. Because the mandate is on the, the, the schools to provide the services. Counties tend, I mean, the way we resolved the San Diego lawsuit was to get the county to have like an MOU with County Office of Ed regarding who provides the services and okay. I'm lost in that puzzle. You raised, you raised two questions. First, it's important to note that in every other state in the United States, this service is managed and carried out and contracted by the schools. The schools. In California, in the mid-1980s, we transferred the responsibility over to counties yeah, and it is a reimbursable mandate. You asked when in the cons when do we modify the Constitution to establish this minimum mm -hmm. funding requirement. That was in Proposition 1A of 2004. And it says that we must pay the minimum amount uh, that have bills that are due and payable over in the state controller's office, or we must suspend or repeal the mandate. We have the report from the state controller's office specifying the minimum, of, um, specifying the amount of claims that are due and payable over there. But are these, uh, this, this program is like EPSDT. What year did we last have audited claims for? Um, 
With this, with this mandate. Because they're a pain. I mean, the auditing on these claims is a problem. I mean, there's, there's a reason that it was moved to the counties because they provide better mental health services. There is a problem when the county schools are told you have to pay for this even if you have no control over what's being served and whether you're leveraging Medi-Cal dollars appropriately. And so auditing claims in this one is a little tricky. You are correct that the claims go to the state controller's office and they do kind of a desk review. And it oftentimes takes a year, two, or three before they actually get out in the fields and audit all the county's records. But this is the amount of claims that are sitting over in the state controller's office that are due and payable. But unaudited. That is so correct. So the 50% would cover something. I mean, we don't know when they're going to get around to finish auditing them, right? That is, that is correct. Um, that usually takes, usually the state controller's office goes out to a county or city and then audits a variety of mandates for a number of years and they do that just for efficiency purposes. Mr. Dutton and then Mr. Nielsen. You, uh, you indicated that this was a federal mandate that by our action of AB 3632 became a, count, became a state mandate. So we changed the nature of the mandate, right? That is correct. The okay. state law also goes a little bit beyond the federal requirements yeah. as well. So it seemed to me the prudent thing to do would be to suspend or repeal the mandate, the state mandate. The schools would still have the well, mandate. Well, but that's the federal mandate. We can take it up with the new administration. Well, but <laughs> talk to the new administration. I mean, it's, it's a federal mandate. Okay, not a state mandate. If we repeal this action, I think that's the prudent fiscal thing to do. So. If we were to suspend this mandate, the obligation would return to schools to carry out this program. Our office has long recommended, as you may know, that the legislature transfer this program back to schools and give counties, give schools authority to contract with counties or other mental health providers to carry out the service. We think there would be benefits both from a cost containment standpoint and also from a policy standpoint. And also, just as a point of reference, there is some one-time special education funding that perhaps could help ease the transition um, if, if the committee wants to shift this program on over to the education side. Um, there are some significant legal and technical issues associated with such a shift. If the committee prefers to leave this with counties, leaving it as a county mandate, then we would recommend that you increase this amount the funded amount by $108 million. Okay. Thanks for asking that question. <laughs> and I'll be more than happy to make the motion that we suspend the mandate if the majority of the committee wants Mr. to Mr. Nielsen. It. Well, I would to second that. Uh, that was the line of inquiry I would like to. Uh, but, but that still, to a degree, begs the issue of the payment to the counties, does it not? We would still have to have some minimal effort to the uh, counties. Should you wish to suspend the mandate, effective July 1, on counties, suspend the mandate on counties, reverting the requirement back to schools, no, you would not need to put in any funding in the budget. You would still owe that money, but you could schedule it out over a, court, a, court, over a period of years. The Constitution says if you wish to mandate again, if you wish to continue the mandate, you must pay the bills. It's kind of like going to the library and they tell you have some fines and you have to pay everything before you can take the book this out. This motion gets rid of the 1A problem then. It, a motion to suspend this mandate effectively transfers the responsibility back to schools. At that point, the state could pay counties this, these, um, any owed funds over a period yeah. of years. Yeah. I would suggest that be a prudent course to consider. At least I've asked the members of the committee to consider that. Department of Finance, would you like to respond? Because since this is the governor's proposal. We think the May revision is the way to go uh, here. There's been lots of discussion about 3632, where best to provide the services to, to these children. We think that the current structure that was arrived at in 5.6 is the way to go. And the May revision essentially delays implementation, the first implementation of that proposal. The services um, are provided by local mental health. We will phase in full funding at, um, at a later date. And we think that's the uh, most advisable course. 
I do think it's um, really problematic to consider right now uh, suspending the mandate, which then simply shifts it to school districts, which also don't have the resources to provide these services. Um, so while it sounds really good because it avoids paying this mandate, it, it really causes other problems and, again, shifts the problem from one place to another and doesn't solve it. Uh, Mr. Cheney? I think that's where we went to last time. I mean, the schools, here's the problem. Special ed already is underfunded. Yes, there is some stimulus money, which is helpful. I don't know that it's enough to pay for this mandate. And they need it just to fund their teachers in special ed. I mean, the problem is special ed already crowds out a lot of the basic school budget. If we put this mandate back on the counties without carefully, on the schools or however we do that, without carefully... I mean, I think this is the debate we had when we went through this the last time. And now I'm remembering it's like deja vu, bad dreams. Um, but, 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 but the problem when San Diego sued and said, you're not paying us, we ain't doing it, then the county schools went crazy and they needed to find the money and we settled it however this is happening. So I'm nervous about upsetting the balance of nature. I, I want some reassurance that everybody's not going to sue at this number. And, and if it's, well, if they haven't got audited claims, because we pay this on a reimbursement basis, we don't pay it up front. I get the theory, but we never pay this up front. We pay it on a reimbursement basis. They have to have audited claims. The odds on them getting audited claims that are more than $50 million in the budget year are so-so. So we, I think that's finances bet here, right? Is that what I'm hearing? Basically, Pretty the nice. mayor revision is consistent with how we've we've handled this in the past, and we think um, we'll you know we'll and we haven't been sued in the last three years. So I move finances proposal. I know Mr. Dutton has a comment. I think it's a big mistake, and if you aren't willing to sit down right now and fix something that sounds very logical to be able to do, and actually you have an opportunity to get additional monies, then you aren't really serious about trying to fix the state's problems. You know, you're so worried about what you're going to create an upset about. I mean, we got a $20 billion plus problem here. And it sounds to me like in the in what the LEO is telling me is that it sounds like we could probably pick up another $52 billion or $52 million in, in scoring the settlement here. And this is, it's not true. They already said, according to, unless I'm wrong, that there's access to additional monies and things like that. Every other state that had, does this except for California from what they just said. Now, I, I you know, I could be Cost wrong. Cost to the schools is much greater than this number. That's what I'm worried about. I, yeah, but it doesn't sound to me like that's going to be the problem from what I heard. They just said you're just changing it because they can contract with the school. The schools can contract with the county. Nothing really ends up changing. It's just the way that we've done this. We've created a state mandate instead of a federal mandate, and the state mandate then it puts it on, under our burden to fund it. And we've been underfunding this program for years. So it just seems to make sense. I, I mean, you made your motion. Uh, that's fine. Uh, you know, we can't support that motion. Okay. I understand your, your argument. I understand your logic. I disagree with your conclusion. <laughs> and, and the big policy question is yeah. the problem I'm concerned about. We can leave it at that, I think. We've got a motion on the Senate side. It's 3-2 to approve. On the Assembly side, it's 3-2 to approve. All right. We will move on to page 115. We're almost at the end of this well, we part of our agenda. 116. Page 116, decrease in evaluations and court testimony and sex offender commitment program for a savings of $5.2 million. Uh, is this a caseload adjustment? This is the runner this? Mandate. Madam Chair, yeah. this, yes, this is a caseload, and uh, the number of referrals from CDCR has dropped. So uh, DMH is, is seeing in both current year and budget year, they're projecting that they're going to be screening and evaluating uh, fewer inmates. And uh, the LAO's uh, comments seem to be that we could achieve even more savings, which we like. I guess based on our analysis, the number of evaluations that are needed appears to be overstated. For example, the number of individuals um, estimated to need initial evaluations in the budget year is 4,600. Um, through March, only 200 or 2,191 evaluations were provided, and therefore it seems unlikely that 2,409 would be provided in the remaining three months. As a result, we believe that at least $3 million in general fund savings could be achieved in both the current year and the budget year for a total savings of $6 million additional on top of what the governor has proposed. So the 5.2 million plus an additional six. 
All right. Those are the LAL. Okay. Uh, three, so three in the budget year. Three, three in the and budget three. Year. Yeah. Eight. Eight point two. Three in current year. Three current. The savings is three in the current year and three in the budget year. Yeah, correct. All right, and so you, that's your motion, Mr. Cheney. Um, I'm moving the LAL recommendation with the understanding that it's the the finance plus three in the current year and three in the budget year for the LAL. Right. Right. Yeah, Department of Finance, and then Mr. Nielsen. I'd just like to point out for budget year, the uh, only concerns with the LAO's proposal are that, um, as was mentioned earlier, these are contracted services uh, mm -hmm. predominantly, and so it, it requires <coughs> these contracts to be negotiated, and depending on the rate that they're finally negotiated at, that makes a difference. The uh, CDCR referrals also uh, can influence the, the outcome, and the referral numbers have been fluctuating. They, they have been, as the LAO points out, they have been trending down, but um, there sometimes backlogs build up. So we, we would just point out that for budget year, uh, reducing the amount by three million is, uh, there are some concerns. Mr. Nielsen? Does, does anybody, this may be more directly for CDCR, but why these evaluation numbers are fluctuating and, and now trending down, any reasons why? I'm very familiar with this act and this population. Any reason why those numbers are trending down that you're aware of? Um, the, the, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure that if it's due to the, the nature of um, some of the individuals that are coming through are um, under the provisions of this program, what they're required to do is look at parolees mm -hmm who have uh, sexually based offense. Predicate offenses. Yeah, and uh, it, it could just be that they're seeing fewer parolees with these types of offenses in their background. Or it could be they're not looking for them, but uh, or, I, I would Or it could be that it, it, there could be backlogs at, at CDCR as well. I'd be a little bit facetious, but mm -hmm. uh, I would support them. All right, so we have a motion, members. On the Assembly side, it's 5-0 to approve, and on the Senate side, it's also 5-0 to approve. And that concludes the Department of Mental Health agenda. So, uh, members, I had intended to uh, finish up by 6 p.m. Uh, we can get started on the Human Services agenda, if that's the pleasure Sorry. of the committee. I see a yes. All right. Then we'll get started, and we'll get as far as we can. Okay, that, that is the wage. Yeah, and I was also just letting Senator Leno know that the LAO didn't think that food stamps for SSI recipients was a, a good option because really? the, they were saying that the administrative costs to open a food stamps case and the amount of the benefit that the SSI recipient would get, it's not worth it's it. It's not worth it. You can ask them for some more details, but that was their immediate reaction. Was and your thought? They looked at it in the past. I mean, if they've looked at the numbers, I haven't. All right. What a bummer. Yeah, it's a really, it's, that's a really, really brutal one. Yeah. These people are. Oh, it's awful.
All right, members, we're um, figuring out the uh, logistics here. What we'd like to do is start out with the vote only calendar because that way we dispense with a number of items and that allows our staff to do a lot of work this evening in reconciling. Uh, and then we'll go back to the beginning of the agenda. So unless there's an objection to doing that, we'd like to start with page 27. It's vote only between pages 27 and 37. And so we'll start by asking if any member has an item to remove from the vote only calendar. Mr. Dutton. Yeah, Madam Chair, we uh, will be voting no on 12. Page 12 will be uh, uh, holding off on uh, page 23, 26 and voting no. We're starting on page 27. 27? Issue. Issue. Oh, I'm sorry. Issue. No, I'm sorry. Issues. Issue number 12 is no. Issue number 2326 will be holding off. Uh, we're just going to stay off those. And then issues 30 and 30, 30, 33 and 34, no. 23, we're staying off. 26, we're staying off. We're voting no on 12. We've got it. Let me just try something. If I might, Madam Chair, Mr. Mr. Go ahead. Um, Senator Dutton, is the issue on 12, um, the ongoing? I mean, I, we had considered that raising the level of poverty probably should sunset when those funds sunset. We could sunset it. I was told January 2011 might meet the federal when we have to spend the money by date. Is that? Yeah, that was our concern. It's the sunset issue. Yeah, the I, I don't have an objection to sunsetting the increase in the poverty rate till those federal funds expire, which no, I was, was just going to pick that a was date. Our issue. I thought it was yeah. January of 2011. Is that anybody down there? We're okay with that as well. So uh, the intent is till okay. is to sunset it on a date that makes sense related to when the federal fund expenditures right. can expire. So mm -hmm. more or less 2011, but y'all resolve the date. Okay, okay so we'll amend issue uh, number 12 to reflect that language and then you're okay with that? Right. All mm -hmm. right. How about on the assembly side? Okay, so then just to make sure we're all clear, on 23 and 26, the Senate Republicans are off. What about the assembly Republicans? 23 and 26, you're on. So on 23 and 26, it's 3-2 on the Senate side and 5-0 on the Assembly side. Or 3-0. No, 5-0. We're off. Oh, We're not off. voting Sorry, at all. Sorry, 3-0. Thank you yeah. for that correction. Then on 30, and 33, and 34, it's 3-I and 2-no on the Senate side. And on the Assembly side... We're 5-0. All right, then. The remainder of the, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. Wait, wait, numbers was those? Okay, and I forgot okay. the Department of Finance has a clarification on an issue too. On items, uh, issues, 23 and 26, it's 3-0 on the Senate side and 5-0 on the Assembly side. Got that? Right, got that one. On 30, 33, and 34. We're okay with 30. All right, then 30, on 30 so and 34, it's... 33 and 34. Sorry, 33 and no, 34, thank you. We, it is 3-I, 2-No on the Senate side, and it's 5-O on the Assembly side. Okay? Now, the Department of Finance has a clarification on one of the other items. I'm sorry. Can you turn on your microphone? Those last two items you mentioned, 33 and 34, right. yeah. uh, the Assembly vote, as is the Senate vote, will be 3-2. Three, 3-2. Two. Three, two. Also. All right. And then the Department of Finance has a clarification on another item. Yes, Madam Chair. John Wardlaw, Department of Finance. Um, item number four, issue two, um, concerning Department of Aging. Whoa, These whoa, are whoa. federal stimulus dollars. Whoa, whoa, um, whoa. We're, we're on page 27 issues. 28. 28. Page 28. Okay. Sorry. Okay. Page Item 28, four. issue 4. Okay. Uh, these oh, are this federal. Is federal dollars. Yeah, not general fund. Yeah. Thank you. Right. So you need to clarify that in reconciliation that there's no general fund cost here. It's right, okay. as, as reflected. Okay. So the, rem the remainder of the vote only calendar is 5050 to adopt. All right. Well, I'm glad we got that part done. 
So we can go back to page, what page are we on? Page one. All right, in the Department of Aging. And uh, what I suggest is we see how far we can get by 6.30 and if there's a logical stopping point around there, that's what we would conclude. Uh, we'll start out with page number one, elimination of multipurpose senior services program for a savings of 13.7. Um, LAO, I think you had a comment or a proposal? Thank you, Madam Chair. Ginny Bella with the Legislative Analyst Office. We actually have a handout that's being circulated that covers this issue and the issue on the next few pages for you. It essentially compares our approach to the governor's approach on several of the aging programs. Essentially, at a high level, the governor is proposing to eliminate some of these programs, and we have a, an option that um, achieves less savings, but incre it creates a county local block grant and gives counties the ability to use, uh, counties, I, I'm saying that loosely, it's actually the area agencies on aging that would have the ability to use those funds to fund the programs that they believe are most appropriate for their communities. Um, so just to walk you through the handout really quickly, the first the first issue is the multipurpose senior services program. Uh, which, Before you do that, yeah. you're talking about items that are on page one, two, and three? One, two, and of three, exactly. Thank you. So we can kind of just walk through those and pause in between if that works best. So the first one is MSSP, and as you as you noted, the governor is proposing to eliminate the program. Our proposal would instead reduce the MSSP program by 50% and transfer those funds into the local block grant, allowing uh, the area agencies on aging to use those funds for either their community-based services program or their Older American Act programs. Uh, there would be no savings achieved under this proposal. It would just simply transfer those MSSP funds uh, to the area agencies on aging uh, for them to flexibly use for the programs they deem to be fit for their communities. That reduced by 50%, it says here, though. Right, but those 50% those would, insta instead of reducing it and booking it as savings, it'd be transferred into the local block grant for, for, the, pro for the area agencies to use on whichever programs they believe would best fit their local needs. So there's no savings, it would just transfer the funds to open them up for different purposes. And we know that triple agent, area agencies on agency on uh, area agencies on aging currently have the authority to shift between the different allocations that the state provides. So they have some ability at the local level to shift between programs for the programs that exist in statute, um, and and they they do that to some extent. Mm -hmm. Mr. De Leon, and then Mr. Blumenfield. Oh, we'll start with Mr. Blumenfield. Okay, I just looking at the. Um, MSSP stuff. I mean, I, you, you talk about Pennywise and Pound Foolish. That's, that's a huge understatement when you talk about this program. Um, and I just, I just nod my head because I know we have to do a lot of things that, you know, cuts where we lose federal dollars, when we lose money. But um, there, there's got to be a limit. I mean, this this kind of program and I, the flagship program for MSSP is in Los Angeles, and I've, I've been there. It's, it's run by Jewish Family Services, um, and they do an incredible job dealing with the most frail and elderly folks and what they do is they keep people out of nursing homes I think it's very important to realize that every single person who is uh, on you know is using the services of MSSP is nursing home eligible that means each person that we you know when we cut this that's sixteen thousand dollars per client more that they're that we're going to be spending as a state so this is one of those things that may score a little bit savings here but I just, I really don't believe that, that those are going to be savings. I think the costs on this are going to be exorbitant. And I wanted to get your sense about that, about what we're really talking about. I mean, not just in terms of the morality of this, because what we're talking about is throwing frail elderly people. I mean, this is, this is one of those lines that we can't cross. But in terms of cost, I mean, how much is this going to cost? And we know it's $16,000 per uh, client and additional, but what do you think the overall cumulative increase is going to be with nursing home fees? Whoever wants the, to take a stab at that one. The proposal does not um, assume a cost shift, and these programs are case management services. So this is more of the management of, of other services that the consumers are receiving, such as IHSS and other um, home and community-based services. The, so this is the case management component, not the You're direct about the service linkages, component. But, but the MSSP stuff is more than case management. MSSP is case management. It's a case management program. 
Mr. Lowenthal. I'm confused. What exactly does the MSSP, if we do this cut, what impact will that have on those seniors age 65 and older who are being provided these services? What is the impact? The, the MSSP is a case management program for uh, certain seniors who are Medi-Cal um, eligible, eligible and, right. and basically this is a case management program that manages other services, IHSS being one of the services that the case managers work to coordinate. This would essentially eliminate the program so they would lose that case management component that MSSP currently provides. But they would still receive the other services. It, 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 it depends on, based on our other proposals, it depends on exactly who they are, their level of acuity, et cetera. So if they're the highest needs consumers, they would continue to receive in-home supportive services to the extent that they, for example, receive home delivered meals. We are retaining those, um, those services and those programs. So, so this is the case management component and there's other, also the direct services component that MSSP manages. Does this get back to what Senator Duchenne said before that we should coordinate all of these and see all those impacts together before we vote on any one given one? We may want to do that. I, I, yeah. let's, let's have more discussion. Um, were there other questions that you had no, at this I point? No, I'm okay. just... Uh, Mr. De Leon, then Mr. Leno, and then I have a question for the LAO on this proposal. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Chair. Um, I, along the likes of uh, uh, the words that um, my colleague, uh, Mr. Bob Williamfield, um, I'm really concerned about this. Um, you know, there's certain tenants, you know, and when you have the frail, you know, the, the elderly, and they can't fend for themselves. And you know, oftentimes, just like young children and babies, they're the most vulnerable. Um, you know, I don't know. You know, just sort of the way that I, I kind of grew up. Um, you've got to honor, you know, the elderly because um, they are frail, and there's no one to defend them. There's no one to protect them. And um, if this is a critical access point for many of these individuals who otherwise would not have access to the services because there's no one out there looking out for them and defending them, then who else is going to do it? You know, and, and Mr. Blumenfield actually stated this earlier today that what this would do, I would make the assumption, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that this would accelerate the life expectancy of these individuals. Uh, this is a critical access point. You know, $13 million in the, in the, the larger scheme of things, and I know we're going to be talking about some other programs that are uh, low in numbers in comparison to other things that we're going to be doing and we'll be cutting. But uh, uh, this is a, a very difficult thing and I just, I just can't see how we could put these people onto the street like this. Mr. Leno. Thank you, Madam Chair. Following up on some of the earlier comments, so to better understand who this population is, they're about 14,000. They're all over 65. They're considered high risk and all medical el medical eligible, and also eligible for nursing homes or determined to be so. So before we would take any action, I think we would need to know how many medical nursing home beds are available, because all of these folks could potentially be in need of one, and, and those costs as well. We don't know that right now. If you could, thanks. Yeah, this is one of those items that it seems like we're shifting the costs and we're scoring savings, but we're not scoring the costs. Um, but we along the concur, lines, Ma Madam Chair, again, Todd Bland with the analyst office. Again, we, we would concur with Finance. We, 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 this is a case management program. The underlying services that we think really are the preventive services, the IHSS and the other things that actually keep them out of the, the, the more intensive long-term care, those are still going to remain. There will still be the ability to connect with those services. It, it, it may be a little harder because we're giving up case management, but in the overall priorities we're looking at here, um, you know, many difficult choices we're making. This one felt to us like a case management layer that perhaps we could afford to get rid of in this environment while retaining sort of the core services underneath. So 
Yeah, I, I understand, thank you. And along the lines of what Mr. Lowenthal was talking about, we, we will be looking uh, later on in this agenda at IHSS and other services that impact the elderly, but also other populations. In, in the Department of Aging, we've got the first four pages devoted to programs that deal with the, the aging population, uh, including elimination of uh, state operations for adult day health care. So at least we're trying to look at the first three items, I think, together. And I had a question about the LAO's proposal because it is intriguing and the idea of giving counties some block grant funds and the ability to as we are doing with school districts, have some flexibility about the services they're providing depending on, on their local needs uh, is interesting to me and I haven't quite concluded what I think of this since we just saw this, but um, I wanna make sure I understand it. You're, you're reducing MSSP funding by 50%, so that means you would, that that program would retain 50% of its funding. Yes. Then the other 50%, that's the reduction, you're taking that and spreading it amongst the, the all three programs, the MSSP, the... Um, uh, it wouldn't actually the be... Linkages. I'm sorry to interrupt. It wouldn't actually be the MSSP program, but the other programs, including linkages and the community-based services programs. So it's just the other two programs, the linkages um, and, and the community-based services? Um, and also the Older American Act programs, which include services such as the Ombudsman program, um, abuse prevention programs, information and assistance programs. They're not actually on your agenda today because they're not uh, May revision issues or um, conference issues, but they are other programs administered by the Department of aging that could benefit from this increased flexibility. So why would we want, not want to allow counties the flexibility though if they wanted to, to put that additional block grant money towards MSSP? Part of the problem there is an administrative problem. The MSSP program operates under a federal waiver where the MSSP sites contract directly with the state. So the ability to actually um, fund them straight from the local block grant would be, I think, administratively impossible and then also it it, it violates the, we've heard from the, the um, administration that it possibly violates uh, conditions of the MSSP waiver because uh, potentially it would not be a statewide program anymore. Some local agencies would choose to invest and some would not. And one of the requirements of the waiver is that it is statewide. Okay. So, but for the comfort level of members who have a, a real serious concern about the elimination of that program, what you're proposing is a 50% reduction, not an elimination. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mr. Blumenfield? Yeah. I just want to comment, you know, we, we're, I think we're very quick to dismiss this case, you know, this as case management, when what makes this program unique and the reason why it's been so effective for these last uh, 20 plus years is because unlike a lot of programs, it's not just about giving one service, it's about connecting a whole range of services together to make it more efficient to keep people out of the nursing home. And the whole point of it is, ma is case management. It's getting elderly folks who are not independent on their own, who would normally go to a nursing home and pay a lot more money, to let them live their final days in, in dignity um, because you can connect all of, the, all of the pieces for them. So it's not like another program where you talk about, well, it's case management and you can sort of give them the service and they'll go on. It's about managing all of all of the different services and connecting them to the different services that they need. So in this case, the case management is inextricably linked to the actual program. Uh, and I just wanted to, to distinguish that from other programs where it's, it's one service and you're managing a whole range of cases. The service here is managing the cases. All right, I'm, I'm having difficulty finding a consensus here. Ms. Walters? I just have a question to the LAO, just looking at your sheet here, um, where you, and maybe I'm confused on this, but where you uh, are talking about reducing MSSP funding by 50%, um, you don't put a number next to that. So I don't understand how you're saving. Right, under this particular piece of our, our overall proposal here, you would not be saving under the MSSP, you'd just be transferring those funds into the local block grant. The savings comes later when we talk about kind of the linkages part, but at this point we've only been to MSSP and there would be no savings at this point. Madam Chair. Yes, Ms. Well, I think the essential point of concern to the members is, is the population getting in some way served. Are you not saying that the majority of this population will have service available? That's what it sounds like to me. 
the MSSP um, consumers are Medi-Cal enrollees, mm -hmm. so they are receiving other Medi-Cal yeah. services. Um, the linkages, the rest of the programs, with the exception of the brown bag programs, are not means-tested programs. So, pro for example, linkages is targeting a different population than the MSSP population. But relative to MSSP, yes, they're Medi-Cal enrollees and eligible for uh, the range of Medi-Cal services. So they're just not wiped out with no, no care, no service, no assistance. There are it, other options available it, to them. It, essentially, it would just be the case management component yeah. that MSSP provides that would, it would go away as a service. The remainder of the medical services okay. would remain. Understood. Thank you. All right, members. Uh, personally, you know, this is the first time I've seen this proposal. Um, I'm intrigued by it. I'm interested in it. I'm not. I, I'm. I lean towards uh, favoring it, <laughs> um, but I don't think all of my members are there yet. And in deference to the need to look at this very carefully and understanding the uh, strong feelings about these programs. Um, I would recommend we hold this open, but I want our staff um, to take a very careful look at this proposal um, and not eliminating the uh, MSSP program and attempting to maintain the kinds of linkages that our communities have been able to find in these programs because uh, the provision of these services is really important for a very, very vulnerable population. And these three programs together are... Um, have been pretty successful at delivering the kinds of services we say we want as a state and yet uh, minimizing our costs, which will be, uh, will lose a lot of money if we send this population to nursing homes. So uh, my recommendation is to hold this open so that we can take a closer look at the LAO's proposal. Good. Uh, with that, without objection, then we'll move on to the next item. I, I agree with you, yes, Madam Mr. Chair. Uh, but it would also, too, I like because it came up in the conversation. Could you get, kind of give us an idea of what other services, like if this was eliminated, what what are the other services that, that this particular group of people are still going to be able to access? Perhaps you can, if you don't have the list now, you can come back. Yeah. Uh, oh, come br that, bring yeah. it back. Yeah. I don't want it now, but yeah. Thank you. I was just seeing looks on their faces <laughs> like. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I think the members' comments and concerns, you know, this is a very, I, I agree, uh, there's, you know, want to make sure not only this particular group of people, but all of them, they're, you know, if there's other programs and stuff, it is important that we have an understanding of that as well. So, thank you. Mr. Cheney. Well, i just make a comment on the notion of doing this. I mean, I, I, I'm intrigued by the local thing, but I'm concerned about saving the money. I've got the same concerns as some of the others do about MSSP, and I kind of think that goes in a package with adult day and IHSS and however all that works out. I mean, there's no point in having MSSP if there's no IHSS and there's no adult daycare because there's no place to send them. So assuming we can find a way to save some of those programs, this one kind of goes in that package, if you will. The other ones here, frankly, I mean, they're all important, but the MSSP qualitatively in my mind is different because everybody who qualifies for it is Medi-Cal eligible. The others are, by and large, not means tested, and that's been an ongoing issue for a long time with this. We get that they're important services to people who are frail and, and elderly and need support, and I'm most sympathetic, if anything, to the brown bags or the nutrition. I mean, that's like a nutrition program or, you know, some of those programs that are there. Um, but whether the counties through their their federal funds and their so somebody look at what federal funds are coming down to help with all these things right now because I know there is some I don't know if it, any of it hits this particularly and also you know what the status of some of those are I mean I, we need to find some savings here but the most reluctance comes in MSSP unless in some combination of how IHSS and adult daycare interacts that MSSP could be reduced because of that. But, but um, the others, much as they're worthy programs, they're not means tested. There's a lot less sympathy, at least, I think, on our side for them. So. Okay. All right, members, uh, moving on to page four an elimination of state operations for adult day health care program <laughs> for savings of $966,000. Uh, my understanding is this. Um, item conforms to whatever action we take in the Department of Health Care Services, and we left that item open with respect to adult day uh, health care. 
So, um, Mr. Cheney has a question, but I think we can go on to the next item. Yeah, it's just a question for LAO as we're leaving it open to consolidate with that conversation. What, I, somewhere there's some, the Department of Public Health has positions, the, and now we're in Department of Aging and we have state positions. Somebody figure out where they really all belong and why we have them in two different places. I mean, is there some opportunity here to create administrative savings through um, figuring out, uh, what is it, one certifies, one licenses, what do they do? Yes, you're correct. The Department of Pub Public Health, Health does the licensing and the Department of Aging does the certification of adult day health care centers. And that's for a reason? I don't know the history for why it's set up that way, but it, that's the way it is as of now. Um, the Department of Public Health um, actually charges a fee to cover the costs of their licensing. A the Department of Aging does not. Um, but we are exploring options of possibly combining the two and being able to cover both under that fee. Well, that would be helpful. And right. I don't, I'm not sure I care which department it goes into, but um, I think licensing has mostly been over there in certification, but it really isn't a public health well, I guess it is. It's got Medi-Cal. Anyway, somebody go forth and, I mean, that's the reason to leave it open. Go figure out where it belongs. Can the fees cover both licensing and certification? And maybe some of the same bureaucrats could do both licensing and certification if we were lucky. Okay. Okay. So we'll move on to page five. Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs, reduction of drug Medi-Cal rates by 10%. Uh, Estimated savings of $8.8 .8 million. Um, any discussion, Mr. Lennon? So we were given a sheet with a chart looking at the reimbursement rates over the past 10 years. And there seems to be significant inconsistency depending upon the program. So for example, Methadone, which I understand is the largest component of this cost, uh, is up about 10 percent. I think I got that right. <coughs> Numbers are so small. Is that up or down? These are all reduced by 10 percent. This is this proposal. So the prior year, you're here at 16 percent. Right. It just seemed more equitable to return to a certain year as opposed to do an across-the-board cut because some would suffer more given that they have not had the increases that others have had. So any reason why we wouldn't want to go back to, let's say, 07, 08? Uh, let us take a look at the issue. I believe that part of the difference in the rate for reimbursements for the NTP program relative to the other programs is a result of litigation. Um, so we need to come back to you with the extent to which we have the same level of flexibility because my understanding is we, we do not. The NTP rate structure was based on litigation, I believe, in the 90s. So we can come back to you on that point. Okay. But that would seem more equitable. Well, that's the first time most of us have seen this proposal. And um, I... Uh, I guess we would have to ask staff to look into that and then we'd have to hold this item open and come back. Yeah, it's just a, a thought of a different way of approaching it. It's, and we think the savings would be more or less the same, but it's a little more orderly way back to the same fees that folks were getting in 07, 08. Everybody's going backward. I'm not sure. So, and you know what, I, well that's the question is what's the savings and how does it work? We can work with staff and come back. This was a proposal from last year as part of our 10% uh, reductions that we proposed last year and also made a revision proposal. All right, so I guess the direction from the committee, unless there's an objection, is to have staff look at this proposal and come back to us, make sure it achieves the same savings but in a more equitable way. All right? Right. Okay, then let's move to page six. Also, Department of Alcohol and Drug Programs, Elimination of Substance Abuse and Crime Prevention Act and Substance Abuse Offender Treatment Program. Yeah, I, I, exactly. The Vice Chair was saying this belongs in corrections and that was my main question. How does this relate to corrections and how do we make a decision now without having been through the corrections agenda or should we ho hold this open until we get there? Department of Finance? Uh, there are some issues under discussion regarding how to use um, 
burn JAG funds that are funds that are made available under the Recovery Act and the extent to which um, you may want to use some of those funds to fund. Um, those funds have a clear non-supplantation requirement. So you could not use those dollars to fund Prop 36, but you could use those funds to save fund drug courts or fund other programs that um, meet a similar need um, to what Prop 36 meets. Um, so, so there is some relationship between the spending plan for those federal funds and um, what happens to the, the, the need for substance abuse train, uh, treatment that is funded currently under Prop 36. All right. Mr. Leno, did you have a I'm, I'm happy comment? to keep it open, but I did just want to ask if how this would play out in the real world in that uh, voters passed uh, Prop 36 back in 2000. So that their desire to see treatment rather than incarceration. The measure put in place a minimum level of funding, $120 million a year for the first five years. We then had to statutorily continue that. If we drop the funding, there's still the voter mandate for treatment, not, serve, uh, not incarceration. But we don't have the money for the treatment. They're not going to get incarceration. So they're just going to walk and not get their treatment, but they're not going to jail. So is, is that actually what would happen? The sentencing changes were permanent, as you've noted. The, the, um, the, the funding was temporary. Um, in terms of what would happen, it depends on the extent to which <laughs> the funding these types of services becomes a priority for uh, local um, substance abuse training, uh, substance abuse funds that are provided federally, generally, and what decisions are made at the local level. But generally, the sentencing changes would remain in effect. Those are not changed by any decisions on the funding side. So what we, I know clearly the dollars are, are tight right now, but what we need to consider is that since we're not, the voters have told us these people will not be incarcerated and we're not going to have the funding for the programs. They're sort of in a, another world, which also was not the desire of the voters to see these folks just walk away. So that's just something we all need to keep in mind. Mr. DeLeon. Thank you very much. If we were to eliminate the uh, uh, SCAPA funding, um, would we push this on to the counties themselves and would they have to cover the costs and are they in a position, would, are they in a position to cover the cost? Counties, these generally most of the offenders that are affected by Prop 36 are, um, are people who, offenders. who serve time at the local level. So it would be a determination of the county level about whether or not they continue to fund um, the program or not. There would not be a requirement on counties to fund um, treatment as uh, Senator Leno has noted. The sentencing changes are permanent. So the, the, the effect of not funding to have treatment. drug offenders wandering around your streets with no treatment. Do we, uh, do we leave any federal dollars on the table? The, yes, there is an interaction. First, there are lo uh, federal funds that are currently subvened to counties, and counties make determinations about how to uh, spend those funds, so they could choose to use some of those funds for some of these um, uh, offenders. In terms of the impact with uh, federal maintenance of effort, yes, there is a relationship between uh, this and what's called the SAPT MOE, the and the, the federal MOE basically looks at a two-year spending test, so in the first first year the, we would lose roughly $120 million in federal funds. The second year it would be about half of that and the third year then it would be reset and we'd go back to our historic funding levels. Do, you know, um, my concern is, and this is, I understand this is a catch-22 and this is where the, the pressure on all of us increases even more so because on one end if we either eliminate, not cut, but eliminate the funding for this program, in effect what you have is you have these nonviolent drug offenders we're pushing on the responsibility to the counties. Most likely, if they don't receive the type of treatment that they sorely need, we already have a, a horrible, horrific recidivism rate, which means our system is completely broken. Most likely, they're going to end up back, I would make the assumption, uh, back in jail You're where the cost is going to rise exponentially. And, and I understand this is, the, again, this is that catch-22 because whatever action that we take, whether it's cutting into it or whether we don't eliminate it, whatever it is we do, we're going to have to find something elsewhere, you know. But I, I, it just, uh, uh, with regards to having these folks just uh, walking all over around the community without access to these types of services, 
is a, is a very scary thought. And this is a difficult reduction for us, and it's a reduction that we don't propose lightly. It's a function of our general fund condition and what we think our general fund can support. Mr. Lowendahl. It just seems to me what you're advocating in a roundabout way is decriminalization of these because you're saying that there's not going to be any the, – the voters have said do not incarcerate provide services. We're not going to provide services, so there's no reason to arrest anyone because they're going to be let out anyway. So why wouldn't you just decriminalize all it, as part of your recommendation? Because if you cut out the funding, that's really what you're doing. The voters made a permanent sentencing change relative to the first two times that um, that people commit these offenses. And I think – and the voters also decided to provide time-limited funding. Uh, this is not a reduction that we come to lightly, and it is not something that is, you know, our best, our, our you know, our ideal general fund solution. We've generally protected it through budget cycles. That said, um, given our general fund condition, I th we think it's a type of reduction that is required. Mr. Leno. I d just have to throw in that the UCLA study has showed that this has been very successful and literally saved the state over a billion dollars. And incarceration, so, and gotten lives back on track. All right. Members, I, what's your pleasure? Should we ho hold this open for discussion? To uh, correction. Madam Chair, we have to hold yeah. it over and maybe yeah. put it in, uh, under corrections. To corrections. corrections. I think mm -hmm. it goes in the corrections. So bring it back in corrections. We've at least started the debate here. Uh, I'd love to see that UCLA, UCLA study. It, and, and it's um, – as the study notes, there's savings to the state and counties, and there's a fiscal incentive also for counties to continue to prioritize these services given the fact that they also stand to benefit financially. Okay, members, um, we're going to hold this item open. We will get the study. Uh, is this a study from last year, this year, two years ago? Two years ago. We yeah. tried to rewrite the bill two years ago. And so, okay. there's, yeah, yeah, there's, they, they do one every couple of years. There, there was an evaluation that was required by the Act, and um, UCLA received the contract to do it. They've done it in phases. Okay, great. Uh, all right. Then, members, um, we'll conclude here for the evening, and uh, we will come back again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Before we conclude, excuse me for munching on one of your M&Ms <laughs> while I'm speaking. My mother told me never to do that. Um, on the vote only items, uh, <clears throat> I think we had a misunderstanding with regard to the items 23 and 26. Uh, you had the assembly with a 5-0 and uh, the, uh, Mr. Uh, Nielsen and I uh, intended to abstain. Like so it should be 3 0. Okay. 3 I, 2 abstentions. On items 23 and 24? Correct. No. Uh, 23, 23 and 26. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. Then that's it. Thank you, everybody. Uh, we're adjourned for today, and we will commence again tomorrow at 10 o'clock. I'm getting.